I come out of a different world, <laughs> and, and, and I'm very happy to be here. But I, I think I get lost very easily. One of the things that, I'm, I'm, that I, I find a fascinating idea, I'm very curious about, is you say that patterns are, are endemic, uh, are very common. And I don't even know what you mean in this context by the word patterns. And Matt, can you give me a couple of words for you? Yes, definitely. So one illustration would just be a simple number sequence, where you have What's the next number? So starting, starting students to think about making predictions based on a pattern that they see. And then you could translate this into functions. I keep going back because Debbie talked about this. But you could have the input plus 2 gives you the output. That's our function for this pattern. So as you get higher, you're using the patterns so more. The equation is a, very, is a special form of a pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, in terms of word problems, another, another way you could do this is have them recognize that most, most common multiplication problems give you the amount per item and the number of items. And then ask for the total. If students know this, this pattern, this model, then no matter the context that the multi multiplication problem is, if they're being asked about like units of hydrochloric acid, and their minds are like, what? Hydrochloric acid, what is that? But they recognize that they're given an amount per, they're given a number of items, and they're asked to find the total. They don't need to bother about the hydrochloric acid. They can just solve the multiplication problem, because that's all it is. So when I say when I say patterns, it can mean a lot of different things. So I'm glad that you asked that question. Thank you. Um, but just teaching students to recognize things that reoccur. And this can start very early. I remember my younger son doing incredibly complex patterns with beads mm -hmm. when he was in preschool. He now has a PhD in physics. <laughs> Of, you know, it was there. Forecasting the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, patterns, you know, something that can be abstracted to fit more than one situation is a good, is, is a good thing to teach your students the structures of so that they have that skill even in an unfamiliar context. They recognize the amount, the number, the total. We're going to give you two. Many, many, many of these problems are two out of three, we call two out of three problems, mm -hmm. right? If I told you I made 600 bucks last week and I worked 40 hours, you can tell me the money, mm -hmm. how much I made back, right? Any, right, there's a million, right? Um, great times, time equals distance, paycheck equals time versus, right? You teach people that go oh, two out of three. Most of these problems require are two, uh, uh, two out of, many problems are two out of three problems. Mm -hmm. So the person begins to look, ask for what are the two, and figure out, figure out the third. Exactly. Yeah, there are three elements in a lot of in most problems. You have the two parts in the whole, and teaching students that part-whole thinking, not just in fractions, but even earlier than fractions, will pay dividends later. And then Denise, did you have a question? Okay, this is kind of a, <laughs> as we go through the spiral, mm -hmm. the external skills should be introduced as the units. I, I use the word units, so I'm being introduced, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to use three words that make my skin crawl. I don't know about anybody else, but in teaching a few institutions, and one of them are stuck on making sure everything applies to common core standards. How would you explain something like that? in that context, because some of those should not be cross-mingling at the moment. You know what I mean? I would say common core standards have K through 12 to hit. So you have 12 years to get through everything. And so they, they have the advantage of having a longer, theoretically, 
people don't know that. Um, but them having having a longer period of time to get through everything, so they can approach things on an A, B, C, D, E, F, G thinking pattern. Um, with the GED, you might have students who need to learn from K to 12, but you don't have 12 years. Yeah. Most students, if they like one year, if they if they haven't gotten it, even even a couple months for some students, if they they've got things to do, places to be. If they don't hit it within a time limit, they're not going to stick around. And so this is primarily focused on the adult learner, so that you can start introducing these higher order concepts that they wouldn't necessarily get until seventh, eighth, ninth grade earlier in their William? I would say for our student population, the, the common core standards are more like guidelines for ways that you can develop critical thinking. It doesn't matter if you cover the standards, as long as the critical thinking comes through. Um, so for instance, I had a student who just took the practice GED, and there was a question, I had her in a class for functions, and I only had her for one semester. And there was a question about um, a bridge and making a model of it. So essentially it was a scale problem, which is like a proportion or a ratio, which we had never said either of those words. But she sat there and she thought about it, and the way that we do functions is really is nowhere close to, I mean, we don't even put an X and Y in there until, say, the last week of the semester. And she sat there and thought about it, and she made a little first quadrant graph, and pretty much made a line <laughs> that represented what the scale would be, and then plugged in the answers, and saw only one of the answers ended up on that line. And that was the one she picked. Well, there was nothing like anything we had ever done, right. but she took that critical thinking that we had developed and took one thing and applied it to another, and to me that's what the Common Core is all about, is to develop that. There's no way in the, what, at most two years you're going to have these students, you're going to cover everything. So that's really what the whole thing is, yeah. to my way of thinking. Yeah, proportional thinking. Yeah, and, and we never covered that at all. Yes. Mm. Joyce? Talk a little about translating. translating. Yeah, well, yeah, what exactly does that mean in this context? The translating is word problems, basically. Oh. Um, and translating a word sentence into a number sentence. Or vice versa, a number sentence into a word sentence. One of the the best things that I, I've, I've had my lower level students do is take like 7 times 3 equals 21 and ask them to create a scenario that explains that. And it starts them thinking, what does this mean? It's not just 7 times 3 equals 21, I've memorized this math fact. It's I have seven people who each have three apples and they're throwing them together into a basket. Or yeah, the other way around. Or the other way around. Eight eight gardens with seven pennies each. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So the translating is starting to think about how our world and our real life situations translate into numbers, and vice versa. What our numbers mean in real life. I, I do backwards teaching in that regards too. We uh, stand on the board, we, uh, teach the uh, teach the concept, teach the skill, and then I tell them to write down. You, you give me the notes. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of uh, you, you know, I, I solve the problem. Now you turn around, and you write out the notes for me. In terms of, and they have to write everything out in words. I even make them write seven times and I so back to the Yeah. And I really I or really make, like make that. Them teach me, so. Oh yeah. Have you all ever seen that triangle that says like the percent retention? Yeah. Where like if you lecture like I'm doing now, sorry guys. Um, people only retain like five percent. If you get them to teach others, mm -hmm. it's ninety percent they'll retain. Yeah. So you want to be building your students to that point where they're able to teach the material instead of you giving them the material. I have a question here. Where would you put people who are largely uh, going through materials by themselves with help when they require? Where does that fall on that there? They're talking the EDP? Yeah, that's, yeah. We, we don't do classes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so this is this is primarily GED focused with the EDP where you can work through one portfolio at a time. No, we're talking about yeah. about what we call the diagnostic page mm -hmm. where they are building up their math and their writing skills. Okay. We Actually, don't teach classes. We have people, we have materials, mm -hmm. like the fluid and the can and there are always figures available when they need help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how how does this fit there? I mean I think 
Depending, I mean, if you're just using preset materials, mm -hmm. then those preset materials may or may not have this, no, this integration. But if, if you're giving your students assistance on going through those materials, right. you can, like if one of the worksheets that they have is just like addition problems. Mm -hmm. Then you can talk to them about when you when you have them working with the tutor. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, do you recognize what's happening in an addition problem where you have like the part and the part and you're getting the total? Right. Can we can we think about the addition problem? We're looking for an unknown. So can we go ahead and replace that question mark with an X so we can start getting used to that using the variable? Mm -hmm. Can we? Um, or with an A, or with a C, or with a, with a Q. Um, okay, well, can we find the perimeter of this? Right. You're, you're, you know how to add, so let's just take it a step further, and we'll find the perimeter using your adding skills. So just a lot of this is about the applications of the skills that you're teaching, and how you can teach the students that these skills are really broad. And math is interconnected. It's, it's so interconnected. And so getting students to start realizing that is, is the first step. But back to how much is retained, it's sort of a combination between lecture and teaching themselves and talking with other students. So it would be somewhere in the middle? Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is a very rough, there's a lot of steps in the middle. There's like audiovisual material, there's uh, demonstrations, there's discussion groups, um, so, yeah, okay, okay. sorry, I, I don't have that <laughs> exact <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, when most me. people are teaching classes. Yeah, yeah, Paul, and then we'll move on after Paul. Yeah. One of the things is, you should, get, if, if it's possible to avoid teaching a tutoring a person, don't ever tutor them by yourself. You'll get much better results. Two or three people at the same time. What if there's over. only one person in the room? Well, then, no. fair enough. I mean, in that, in that, in that sense, that's, tr that's true. But as a practice, we should. Right. I mean, unless a person has a serious mental illness, yeah. you should try to tutor them two or three people right. together. Because right. they have to see how the other person is learning it. Is, is it itself modeling this process? Are these others going to have the same skills that one? Even if it's not exactly, doesn't there's a there's a lot of research that teaching in a group is the best students working in groups together. Like a normal class setting. No, 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 no. I mean small, small groups. Small groups. When you're not there, it's the most effective thing you can do because most of the students we're dealing with have psychological issues that are at least as important as their skill sets. So you 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 your work with three other black women your age. Convinces you black women your age to do this, which is which is one of the biggest issues that people have. At least uh, most of us students have approaching this thing. Well, I don't have a stigma. My child was diagnosed with LD, ADHD at the age of ten. So uh -huh. I don't have a stigma about that. I'm just questioning. No, 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 no. Yeah, and that's thank you, Paul. That's that's a great point. That working with others lets students to expand their perspective because they see more than their own. But for your question, Joyce, if you're in a one-on-one -on -one situation then it, it can be hard to have a teacher or a tutor fill the same role as a peer, but try to have that teacher or tutor interact with, with their students. I ask questions. Not just in an instructional manner, but in a, in a discussional manner, in a dialogical manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so we're going we're gonna to move on. And we do have a section at the end for questions um, as well. I'm going to turn it over to Riley. We have, we have finished talking about how we scaffold and how we integrate skills deeply into the curriculum. And the next piece we're going to talk about is how we frame these skills in a way that we can also use to help the students abstract and generalize and think critically.